Welcome to Staff Voices by the Center for Deployment Psychology. Today, Dr. Kelly Cressman discusses the role of re-experiencing in post-traumatic stress disorder. Our understanding of PTSD has evolved so much in the last 20 years, and there are so many incredible researchers and clinicians who continue to work extending our knowledge. In this podcast, I want to dig a little deeper into some of the literature investigating PTSD, specifically the phenomenon of re-experiencing, and discuss some implications that can help you sharpen and focus your treatment. Anka Ellers and her colleagues in Oxford have written extensively about re-experiencing, and much of what I'm going to summarize is based on her work, so I'm including a list of references on the website for anyone who would like to go deeper and read the original papers. Let's start by being really clear about what we mean when we say re-experiencing. According to DSM-5, re-experiencing includes distressing memories, dreams, dissociative reactions, distress at being reminded, and physiological reactions to reminders of the trauma. The criterion for re-experiencing has become much more specific since the inception of the diagnosis. The term intrusive thought, though it's historically been used interchangeably to describe all kinds of disturbing cognitions in PTSD, is actually a rather broad and vague term and has led to some confusion about the phenomenology of this criterion. In fact, the research of Ehlers and others has demonstrated that re-experiencing symptoms, intrusive memories, are better described as brief sensory impressions of the traumatic experience. Often these are visual, like an image of a face or salient details from a scene, accompanied by distressing affect, but it can also include sound, smells, taste, bodily sensations, or a combination of these. Ehlers describes, for example, a man who repeatedly re-experienced headlights coming toward him which heralded a car accident, and a rape victim who kept seeing an image of her assailant looking at her through the mail slot prior to the rape. These vivid sensory impressions have been shown to be predictive of PTSD and to change with successful therapy. Another characteristic of re-experiencing is a lack of time perspective. Ordinary memories of specific autobiographical events or episodic memories usually include some awareness of that the event occurred in a particular time and place. When episodic memories are retrieved, there's a sense of the self in the past. This doesn't appear to be true of re-experiencing symptoms. Ellers and others have called this nowness. The sensation and impressions are re-experienced as if they're happening in the present, and they're appraised as presently meaningful. And this is the important part. The danger seems to be in the here and now, and may not be connected to other presently available information that would change the meaning of that. For example, a man re-experienced the click of a trigger, as his assailant threatened him with a gun that was in reality empty of bullets. The memory of the click was re-experienced along with the meaning and felt sense that he had at the time, I am about to be killed though at other times the man was able to remember that he survived. In the extreme, this is a flashback, where the ability to distinguish past and present is lost and the person acts as if the images and sensations within the memory are happening now. This can even include affect without recollection, that is, an emotional, physiological response to a trigger without ready conscious recall of the trauma. This can be experienced as out of the blue, much like a panic patient would describe panic attacks, but like panic patients, a trigger can often be identified when the situation is reviewed. For example, a combat veteran who becomes anxious and angry on a city street for no apparent reason was later able to identify the faint smell of a trash can that triggered a memory of a smell he associated with recovering remains after combat. In the moment, he experienced the angry, anxious emotions unaccompanied by the images he later connected to that smell. In fact, Intrusive memories seem to be easily triggered by a range of matching cues that may or may not be meaningfully related to the trauma. On investigation, the cues seem to share sensory similarities with the stimuli that were present before and during the trauma. Context is also commonly lost in the re-experienced memory. Memories can seem stereotyped, repetitive, and are unaffected by contextual information that might change the meaning of the moment. For example, A Vietnam veteran often re-experienced the urge to survey the perimeter of his property. He called it walking the perimeter. And he was often unable to resist this urge to walk around the rural residence in the evening carrying a weapon and performing a series of actions similar to being on patrol in order to ensure that he and his family would be safe at night. This happened more frequently on hot summer nights that triggered memories of the jungle climate of Vietnam. The veteran was unable in the present to reappraise the meaning of the hot, muggy weather in the context of his home in Mississippi, and instead reacted to the strong association between the sensations and his nights on patrol in Vietnam. 
Intrusive memories may even contradict one another and can contribute to the sense of disorganization and fragmentation that you see in patients with PTSD. Ellers provides this example of a woman whose daughter died in a house fire. The woman experienced intrusive images of curtains and flames that, at the time of the fire, were associated with the belief that her daughter was burning in the flames. She also experienced intrusive imagery of her daughter not burned, but lying in the mortuary later when she was found dead. Her recollections appear to be contradictory, but in reality they represent two distinct time points in the trauma. Her recollection of each experience is accurate for the detail at the time of the trauma, but her appraisal of the meaning, and therefore her distress recollecting the curtains, is unaffected by the second memory, which informs that her daughter did not burn to death. Finally, though it seems logical that the content of intrusive memories would be focused around the worst moment or moments within the trauma, interestingly, this isn't often the case. In research of Ellers and others, many of the sensory impressions that were re-experienced by people with PTSD represented a point near the onset of the worst moment, leading to a hypothesis that the re-experienced memory is conditioned to serve as a warning signal, temporarily associated with the trauma and having some predictive significance. The warning signals people experienced were not necessarily meaningfully related to the trauma, but tended to be descriptive of the context of the situation, an image, a sound, a sensation, something like that. For example, Ellers describes a woman who re-experienced the doctor standing around her bed. At the time, she was safe and being cared for, but the memory occurred just before she was told about the death of other family members who were in the car with her. So the memory heralded that knowledge. Further, the moments may not have occurred during the trauma, but later when the patient realized what did or what could have happened. Though not the worst moment during the event, these warning signals represent extremely meaningful moments in terms of safety or danger. A woman, for example, who was raped by a serial rapist didn't develop PTSD initially, but when the rapist later murdered his next victims, the woman developed symptoms. She re-experienced hearing the announcement of the subsequent victims, information that meaningfully changed her appraisal of what happened to her as more dangerous, potentially deadly. Moreover, there could be more than one image or impression that's recalled, each representing crucial moments that change the meaning of the event for the worst. For example, a woman who was raped experienced the sounds of several voices talking over one another, the physiological sensation of hot flashes and cold sweats, and then also the sound of a door lock clicking, all triggers for different moments within a trauma in which the woman was first in a bar, then she was drugged and taken into a room where she was raped. Each represented a moment just before the situation took a turn for the worse. Consistent with the warning signal hypothesis, matching cues seem to be the triggers for re-experiencing. Often these are temporally associated, occurring just before the worst moment of the trauma rather than meaningfully related, and the person isn't necessarily aware of the trigger, thus the re-experiencing can often seem to come out of the blue. So three factors, loss of time perspective, loss of context, and easily triggered by matching cues. In contrast, Ellers and Clark point out people are not flooded with involuntary memories about ordinary events despite being surrounded by potential cues. This is because most autobiographical events are elaborated and incorporated into our knowledge base, and that includes meaning that makes recall more specific and contextual, so memories are retrieved when it's adaptive to do so and inhibited when the cues aren't meaningful to the particular time and context. Traumatic events, by contrast, are not fully elaborated and integrated into the knowledge base, so they're easily susceptible to being triggered by matching cues. The enhanced sensitivity and strong response to cues appears to be adaptive, actually. In the aftermath of a trauma, the individual is well served by reevaluating the safety of the environment and identifying factors that signal risk. As time passes, most people begin to notice that many of the triggers they experience are false alarms, and they're able to incorporate this information into their knowledge base. Failure to connect the memory to contextual information that elaborates and clarifies the level of danger as well as a failure to even recognize the trigger that cued the re-experiencing can really inhibit that elaboration and help to maintain the symptoms. So how is this going to help you focus your treatment? Well, trauma-focused treatment addresses the traumatic event directly, often by having the patient intentionally recall the event. Intentionally recalled narrative trauma memories are different from re-experienced memories in that the patient is intentionally reviewing and, by the way, defining their experience using words. This results in a narrative, however imperfect, with a beginning, a middle, and an end, in some ways resembling ordinary autobiographical memories. When they do this, patients with PTSD are usually able to communicate the big picture details of what happened, even though there's quite often confusion about order and context. 
This begins the process of elaboration. In addition, though, the narrative will likely contain parts that are associated with intense emotion and a sense of reliving. These have been termed hotspots, flashback memories, or stuck points by various theorists, but they're commonly described as the most emotional parts of the memory. These points in the narrative appear to be closely related or similar to the unintentional intrusive memories that are re-experienced. They also appear disconnected from the rest of the memory such that trauma narratives often resemble a series of separate or disconnected memories rather than a single event that occurs along a timeline. The aim of treatment then becomes to identify these hot spots or stuck points and elaborate them, connect them to the time and context in which they happened, and help the patient develop ways of discriminating between what happened then and what happens now when those cues are encountered in their current life. In PE, this occurs both during exposure and more pointedly in the processing of the trauma narrative after imaginal exposure. In CPT, this happens during the analysis of thought records or in, you know, particularly when analyzing step points. EMDR directs this process a little differently by asking the patient to consider alternative outcomes, but the common thread is the elaboration of the re-experienced phenomena so that the patient can discriminate and respond differently. Keeping these theoretical constructs in mind as you implement the different aspects of your chosen treatment can help you strategically focus on the content that is most responsible for keeping symptoms alive and can give you clues about where to go when treatment seems to stall or become derailed. Next in our series in post-traumatic stress disorder, Dr. Kelly Kressman will be discussing working with low distress tolerance.